17-year-old founder of Subway had never made a Subway sandwich in his life and his first restaurant failed miserably. So how did Subway overtake McDonald's and become the biggest fast food chain in the entire world? This is a story of both struggles and success, a tale of lawsuits and lies. This is the controversial history of Subway. In 1965, 17-year-old Fred DeLuca wanted to become a doctor, but he had a problem. He was the son of poor Italian-American immigrants and earned just $1.25 an hour at a hardware store. So he had no idea how he was going to pay for medical school. He'd grown up in public housing in the Bronx, and his family barely had enough money to scrape by. But then one day, Fred and his parents got invited to a barbecue at the house of an old family friend, a nuclear physicist named Peter Volpe, from the size of his house. It was clear that Peter was well off, and so Fred decided to ask him how he could make enough money for college, secretly hoping Peter might give him a loan. Instead, Peter's answer was not what he expected. Peter said you should open a submarine sandwich shop. Now, a couple of issues here. Number one, Fred had no money. Number two, he literally never made a sandwich in his life. But Peter explained how it would be pretty simple. Open a small store, build a counter, and then buy some different fillings and breads. Peter had actually had this idea for a while, but didn't have time to run it himself. So he said they could be business partners. Fred would run the day-to-day -day management of the store and Peter would give him a $1,000 loan to get started. This was not how Fred had expected this family barbecue to go, but he was now in business. Unfortunately, it was a business he knew absolutely nothing about. But still, in 1965, 17-year-old Fred used that initial loan from his new business partner along with some help from his mother to open his first sandwich shop. It was located in Bridgeport, Connecticut, although originally it wasn't called Subway. They named it Pete's Super Submarines to drum up interest in their launch. Fred handed out flyers all across the local area and on the first day of trading they sold 312 sandwiches, costing less than a dollar each. Unfortunately, after the initial hype in the first couple of weeks, sales started to fall. To make matters worse, when Fred spent money to run some local radio ads, potential customers couldn't even properly understand them because of his heavy Brooklyn accent. Fred's lack of business experience meant their sandwich shop was failing. In fact, by the end of Fred's first summer of running pizza submarines, he had just $6. For many people, this would be the point where the story ends, the business closes, and they move on. But not for Fred and Peter. Instead, they made an extremely bold business move. Despite their first store in Bridgeport clearly not going well at all, they decided to open another restaurant to create the image of success. They figured if they had multiple locations, people would assume they must be doing really well and have great products. It was also around this point in 1968 when they rebranded to the much shorter and simpler name Subway. Peter and Fred were so adamant the idea could work. They set themselves an ambitious goal of opening 32 subways in the next 10 years. Both of them believed the key to success was visibility and marketing, so they made sure their next subway restaurants were much more visible, prominent locations. This led them to their first profitable year, earning $7,000. Not a lot of money considering the work they put in, but proof this business could be profitable. So they continued to reinvest money into opening more locations and advertising. Subway was on the up and the persistence was paying off. By 1974, this unlikely duo had grown from a single failing sandwich store to 16 different Subway branches throughout Connecticut. However, their expansion had caused a problem. Each of their restaurants were quite inconsistent in how they looked and operated. Depending on which Subway restaurant you visited, the experience could be very different as they couldn't properly manage them all. And there was also another problem. They'd originally set a goal of 32 restaurants in 10 years and with only two years left on that target, they were only halfway there it would be impossible to hit their goal at this current rate. And then Fred had an idea, an idea that could solve both of these problems and make them more money for much less work. And it was this idea that ultimately transformed Subway into the biggest fast food restaurant on the planet. Fred wondered if instead of directly owning and managing their future Subway restaurants themselves, what if they franchised and let other driven entrepreneurs have their own Subway restaurant, which they were fully focused on. But that followed the exact same format and menu that had been successful with their first six locations. This way Fred and Peter didn't have to worry about operating their own restaurants and dealing with customers, staff, and suppliers themselves. Other people would pay to set up a Subway restaurant and use all the Subway branding and products. This is when Peter's role in the business started to get even smaller. He became a silent partner and didn't even have his own office at Subway HQ. 
If someone asked him a question about the business, he would famously say, talk to Fred. Peter did continue to take his share of the profits, though earning him an incredible return on his initial $1,000 investment. But still, once Fred and Peter agreed to franchise Subway in 1974, they managed to get 15 franchisees signed up that year. And by 1981, they got national opening 200 locations across the United States and 100 more the following year. This growth was much faster than what they'd been able to achieve by doing everything themselves. Franchising was clearly the way forward for Subway and is how the business has been run ever since. It helped that in the 80s and 90s, Subway franchises were one of the cheapest sets up, costing a fraction of the amount it takes to set up a McDonald's, Taco Bell, or Wendy's that need more expensive equipment. Unlike those fast food chains, Subway wanted its franchised locations to be faster, build, cheap to run, and inconvenient, sometimes unconventional locations. You can find subways in petrol stations, airports, post offices, hospitals, universities, and even a military bases. It gets weirder too. A fake Virginia town built by the FBI to train its agents is home to a very real subway isn't entirely kosher subway in a Jewish community center in Ohio. And you can even get your hands on a foot long in a German river cruise ship. But subway, no location is too strange or small. It'll open a franchise virtually anywhere, and this enabled them to expand more rapidly than competitors. And remember, Fred and Peter not only got an upfront fee for every new franchisee, they also got 8% ongoing royalties of all the money the franchise made at its peak. Fred was receiving checks worth roughly $7 million every Monday, which were his royalties from all the different Subway stores. However, what this franchise model was proving great for Fred and Peter, for the franchisees actually running Subway shops, things were not so great. Fred had an extremely hands-on approach and was known for micromanaging his franchisees. In fact, it's claimed Fred had no personal boundaries at all and reportedly felt like he could come onto the wives of franchisee owners at subway conventions because he believed their husband's success was all down to him. One business associate claimed if he wore a skirt and had a pulse, he would chase you. Meanwhile, many franchise owners had accused the company of defrauding them or tricking them into binding, uncompromising contracts. In 1998, 40% of Subway franchise owners said they were just getting by and making a few dollars. Part of the problem is that Fred was so keen to expand Subway and open more stores that it was very common for them to set up multiple Subways in a small area, making it very difficult for one restaurant to make much profit because there was just too much competition. When asked about this, Fred said, It bothers me that people lose money, but I don't lose sleep over it. This is America. The Subway sales team who signed up new franchisees also seemed to be quite targeted in their sales approach. A former Subway executive said 30 to 50% of franchisees are immigrants and many struggle to understand the complex contracts they were signing because they were written in their second or third language. When one Subway exec suggested maths and English comprehension tests to check franchisees fully knew what they were signing up for, Subway's management rejected the idea. For many of Subway sales executives, all that mattered was signing up more and more franchisees. It didn't matter if those people understood the risks and costs they were taking on. One ex-Subway employee even said, I've seen over 300 franchise agreements and Subways is the worst. In fact, some of the contract terms were even declared illegal in certain US states. It gave Wright the power to seize any franchise and its assets. If he wanted to state that, he could set up franchises close together, making the restaurants fight each other for business and ban franchise owners from ever talking to the media. In 2017, seven Subway franchises decided to break this rule and told Business Insider the Subway slogan, Eat Fresh, is far from true. The ingredients they were forced to order only arrived once a week, leading to mushy and rotten vegetables. If they tried to order from different suppliers or schedule more regular orders, some had their franchises taken away and licenses revoked. If even the cucumbers weren't sliced correctly, franchisees could risk having their royalty rates increased or losing their restaurant altogether. Considering all this, you may assume many franchise owners would want to take legal action, but their contracts forbid them from ever suing Subway. Meanwhile, things were going great for freedom. Pizza. Subway was going international, opening its first restaurant outside the US in 1984. But unlike many other chains, they didn't choose Europe or Asia. The first international subway opened in Bahrain, a small Arab state made up of over 30 individual islands. It's never been confirmed why Subway chose this unlikely location, but it's been speculated that the small size made it a great place for testing out Subway's products and a new territory. Fred was constantly obsessed with opening more stores. He'd set goals for how many stores they should open each year and all the employees would think it was insane, but then they'd actually achieve that. And instead of going on holiday, Fred would go abroad to find new locations for Subway to expand. 
So despite some unhappy franchisees, Subway's plan for fast global expansion was in full flow and to cement their reputation and boost sales even more. The company was about to take advantage of one of the greatest promotions in fast food history. Unfortunately, it would end up causing a gigantic scandal. In the 1990 and early 2000, Subway developed a key marketing strategy that made it stand out from the rest of the fast food crowd. It pushed the message, but its sandwiches were pretty healthy. After all, the ingredients all look fresh. They make their bread on site. Nothing was deep fried and the customer could choose exactly what to put on their sandwich from ingredients laid out right in front of them. According to Subway, there are technically 4.9 billion possible combinations. So in 1997, Subway started to advertise seven sandwiches it claims were low-fat, comparing them to the high-calorie burgers and tacos made by their rivals. Not only that, but Subway could claim something really impressive. A customer of theirs named Jared Fogel claimed to have lost 245 pounds by eating two Subway sandwiches each day. It was such great marketing that Subway hired him as their spokesperson in 2000. Jared Fogel became a successful face and body of Subway representing the Subway diet. His ads were a massive hit. In fact, sales increased by 20% after his first commercial ads. At one point, Subway's chief marketing officer reportedly claimed Fogel was responsible for up to half of Subway's recent growth. Fogel's Subway diet made him a celebrity and he featured in Subway ads for over a decade, often holding up the giant pair of jeans he used to fit into. Aaron Fogel was starring in TV commercials, boosting sandwich sales, and even meeting Oprah. Subway had seemingly hit the jackpot by finding this guy to be the face of that brand. And then just about the absolute worst thing that could happen involving your company's spokesperson actually happened. In 2015, Fogel Home was raided and they found explicit images and messages with young kids. He was convicted of possessing and distributing child abuse images and grooming and exploiting minors. He was sentenced to 15 years in prison. Subway abruptly cut ties with Fogel and, of course, denied any knowledge of this. And to be fair, when I first heard this, my first thought was this was just really unfortunate for Subway as, of course, they wouldn't have known. And having the face of your brand associated with something so horrific is a brand nightmare. However, then I dug a little deeper. It turns out that Vogel's ex-wife actually sued Subway, claiming the company had been told about Vogel's interest in children. But since they were making so much money from his ads, they did nothing about it. And Subway's controversies didn't stop there as their health claims soon started to come under severe criticism as well. This is when the lawsuits and accusations began. Subway was accused of using a chemical found in yoga mats to make its bread using a substance that wasn't really tuna and having chicken that contained more soya than meat. Not to mention, they were accused of selling footlong actually only 11 inches long. Subway challenged all these statements and settled some of them out of court, although they did agree to phase out the yoga mat chemical. But then another PR disaster for Subway came when an Irish Subway franchisee had the idea of claiming that the brand's bread could be VAT exempt because bread is classed as a staple food so shouldn't be taxed the same way. The Irish government decided to investigate and its analysis of Subway's bread recipe found it contained five times more sugar than the average loaf. And so it could actually be taxed as a dessert. So the whole idea to try and pay less tax massively backfired on Subway's reputation as a healthy choice was in tatters. Fred had big goals from the very early days of the company, even back when it was called Pete Super Submarines. In fact, according to that very first employee, Fred always wanted his company to be bigger than McDonald's and would never be happy until he achieved that. And by 2011, Subway had done it was McDonald's still dwarfed them in revenue. Subway was winning in terms of total locations. And in 2016, the chain heads peak with 44,000 locations worldwide, serving an estimated 5,300 sandwiches every minute. Unfortunately, Fred would not be there to see that as he died of leukemia in 2015. By the time of his death, his net worth had passed $3 billion and yet he was still incredibly frugal. One person even recalled him refusing to pay $2 for a bottle of water on principle whilst he was at times a controversial figure. There's no doubt he'd played the pivotal role in turning Subway from one failing sandwich shop into the world's biggest fast food empire. The problem was he'd always refused to relinquish much power and control and that's when Fred died. There was no real succession plan and nobody else understood the business as well as Fred had. It's perhaps then not surprising that Subway's location count has declined every year since Fred died in 2015. 
Franchisees interviewed by Business Insider in 2018 claim that one-third of its U.S. locations are not profitable and Subway's business model has been described as too big, too fast, creating too much competition with itself, making it impossible for every franchise to make a healthy profit. Fred's lifelong obsession with expansion had perhaps gone too far. Plus, whilst other fast food restaurants were innovating their menus and locations, Subway without its original leader was now stagnating. Not to mention that Subway had lost its crucial marketing tools like Jared Fogel and its perceived reputation as a healthy choice. In fact, one journalist tried the Subway diet in 2016, eating the lowest calorie sandwiches twice a day for a week. And at the end of it, they claimed Subway will never again be on the cutting edge of health, at least not for a very long time. Plus, the various lawsuits about mystery meat and weird ingredients are damaged the brand. Prices were rising considerably and the connection to Jared Fogel was hard to fully shake off. In other words, Subway seems to be on the decline. Of course, there's still an absolutely massive fast food chain making a lot of money and still have plenty of time to turn things around. But what the next chapter of the Subway story holds still remains to be seen.